Hey, everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Hey, Chris, how are you doing this morning? I am wonderful. Thank you for asking. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Hey, what do we got going on today? Well, we are going to be talking with a pig expert, which I'm so excited about. But before we get to that, Mm -hmm. I was in my car yesterday and heard this DJ discussing this new study that came out. And of course, I had to call you right away. And I said, can we talk about it on the show? Please, please, please. (laughs) Okay. Well, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. And this is the premise. Okay. Okay. So the study was about frogs and these particular frogs, a certain species, the female fakes her own death in order to thwart the attention uh, of male frogs. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I was kind of trying to come up with a colorful word, the, the suitors that would be, yes, the attention of male frogs. And all of these women were calling into the show and saying, this is my new spirit animal. Listen, this is the frog's uh, version of ghosting. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But, but honestly, when you call me, I did, I looked up the study. It's a study about European female frogs. And again, like you said, they'll fake their own death to avoid mating with male frogs. And I thought, we are not giving animals enough credit for their intelligence and their adaptability. And just, you know, it's a fascinating study. And I'm glad you called me about it. It was very interesting. Of course. Listen, hey, before we start the show, I have one more thing to tell you. Day, October 12th, 2023, today is National Pet Obesity Awareness Day. And I'm glad that they've dedicated an entire day to this because it is, with no pun intended, a really big problem yes. with our pets getting getting obese. And, and it's the uh, it's really the catalyst for all kinds of other diseases that, that can follow, you know, diabetes and all kinds of other, you know, things from obesity. So we have a show on that. It's dedicated completely to pet obesity maybe we could even talk to our guest a little bit about you know is pet obesity a problem in pot belly pigs like maybe that maybe it is i don't know but we're going to find out from our guest we reached out to uh, susan armstrong maggotson after chris saw susan on a segment of the cbs sunday morning show about pot belly pig rescue and susan is the driving force behind a remarkable pig rescue organization the pig placement network and Ross Milk Farm. And it's been, her life's work has been providing sanctuary and care for these intelligent and probably often misunderstood animal. I'm not sure if the audience knows this, Chris, um, and I'm not sure if we've talked about it on other shows or not, but Chris and I had a pig patient and she had injured her leg and I was called in by the veterinarian to help with her rehabilitation. And then of course I called Chris in to collaborate. You know, and together we came up with this plan for treatment for our friend Penelope, or I'm sorry, Her Royal Highness Penelope. That's right. (laughs) That's right. You know, it did present some challenges, you know, because we were unsure about how Penny would tolerate treatment or how would we motivate her or whether she would even like, would she understand what we're asking her to do? And what we found is, yes, yes, she was totally down for the exercises and learning new things and just the whole interaction she seemed to genuinely enjoy you know and we did all the same things with her that we would do for dogs and rehabilitation she you know acclimated to using equipment like the therapy balls uh, walking over cavaletti rails Uh, she let us use the laser and then she had to wear the safety goggles to use the laser and she allowed for all of that 
you know, as long as we were treating her in a respectful manner and, and providing her with rewards, I think she was genuinely, you know, happy about the interaction. One of the things that was really a success with, with Penny was using the snuffle ball. As I think about it, what do we say pigs do? Snuffle. They snuffle. They snuffle. Right? So, you know, here we've, we've used this magical, you know, tool with our, our dog patients and really it, we probably owe it all to the pig in the first place. Yeah, right, that was a right. natural fit. I feel like I learned so much from her. You know, she had a wide range of vocalizations and body language that she used to communicate her emotions and her intentions. And I think her emotions, from my perspective, was every bit as complex as our own. She would, you know, she had happiness, she could get angry, she could get sad, she could get disappointed, and she could be mischievous. And her problem solving skills were just remarkable. You know, and according to her owner, she demonstrated capacity for empathy and, and reading her owner's emotions, which I was like, wow, we are just not giving these pigs enough credit for their emotional intelligence or their intelligence in, in general. And I think there may be a misconception about pigs, right? That maybe we just picture them as, you know, rolling around in the mud and, and eating anything and everything. But pigs are very complex and they are the fourth. Pigs are the fourth intelligent animal after humans, primates, and dolphins. They're in the top five for intelligence level. And, and so they're far more emotionally attuned and intelligent than we're giving them credit for. And I have to tell you, I saw this story not that long ago on the internet from a show. I think it was called Hero Pets, and it was on National Geographic. And it was a woman who owned a pig, so it was just her and her pig, Lulu. And the owner had a heart attack, and she was laying on the floor and she couldn't get to the phone, and she, she couldn't get help. And her pig, Lulu, went through her door flap, down the path to the road to get help. And she did this for 45 minutes, going back and forth, checking on the owner and going back to the road, checking on the owner, going back to the road, until somebody stopped and followed her to their home. I mean, she saved this woman. Wow. And she had to understand that, you know, she had to put this together and understand, you know, this was a crisis and put together a plan. I mean, that was incredible. So um, that could almost make me cry. Just think about Lulu, you know, going out there and trying to save her mom and, and, and putting that all together, you know. So I'm really interested to hear what, what Susan has to say about why a pot belly pig can be a good pet. How do we meet their needs emotionally? How do we meet their physical needs? How do we meet their medical needs? And conversely, you know, why do people uh, surrender or rehome their pigs? You know, when I, I get it, there's nothing cuter than a baby pig. I mean, if you've seen a baby pig, there's nothing cute. Maybe a baby duck. I don't know. They're very, very cute. But I think that because of their intelligence, I think they can, you know, be challenging. And you really need to understand the nature and the characteristics of the populate pig before you consider getting one. So I'm really interested to hear what Susan has to say. So let me, before we get started, Chris, let me just give you a little bit of background on our friend Susan, okay? Susan has been raising pet pigs for 33 years. She is the owner and executive director at Ross Mill Farm, where she cares for 163 pet pigs on her 30-acre farm. Susan lectures extensively throughout the United States on topics of understanding and managing pig behavior, caring for the pet pig, health and nutrition, and training of pigs. And in uh, 1998, Susan co-founded the Pig Placement Network, a service as that assists pet owners to rehome or rehoming their pigs and rescuing pigs. And they have placed, they place about 55 foster pet pigs a year through the Pig Placement Network. Uh, Susan has been interviewed extensively on CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, Fox News, Sunday Morning Show, and Petability Podcast. <laughs> So in the realm of animal welfare, Susan, you know, she's a standout with her unwavering commitment to raise awareness about pot belly pigs and advocating for their well-being. So please welcome Susan to the show. Welcome, Susan. So happy to have you here. It's so nice to be welcomed. And thank you, Chris and Kathy, for asking me to come on the podcast today. I think it's an important topic, Susan. I think that I've seen an increase in maybe popularity and people adopting potbelly pigs. So I would love to hear you start off with talking about the pig as a pet and why. Well, you already touched on a couple of things with, with your experience with Penny. 
she is intelligent. She has about um, the understanding of a three-year-old child and the emotional stability of a three-year-old. They have very complex thoughts and that's where you saw that problem solving. Uh, they live in social hierarchy and they must have a leader and it's very important that that people make sure that they maintain that leadership role. They're emotional. They're a very emotional animal and you already know that from working with Penny. She, they, she had some likes and she had some dislikes and so you saw those emotional variances like uh, happy and sad and grief and anger, boredom and fear, but they're also very affectionate towards their owner or of certain members in the family. They're also very curious and they will overcome their timid behavior because they're a prey animal. And because they're a prey animal, they act more like a little rabbit than they do the cat. They have to build trust with their people before they feel comfort. And sometimes that takes a couple of weeks. So that initial time with your pig is, is very important to build trust and routine. They live in a world of routine. So the training of these guys, uh, if if you know about clicker training, they're pros at it. They catch on almost immediately. I can get a piglet to do unbelievable things within uh, a five minute session. They're very easy to train using food as a reward. However, we spoil them with food and they start to head swipe, charge and bite because of food. And I have saved so many pigs in their home simply by telling the family, put away the treat jar, no more treats, two meals a day, and that's it. And they can't believe that the behaviors dissipated just because of that. So that is something that uh, pigs, um, hmm, they get in trouble. So you have to learn as a pig owner how to make the pig behave without using food. I mean, I know they'd rather have food, but do you think that they could be re responding to praise if we taught them a new trick and then told them how great they were? Uh, like we do with dogs? Absolutely. They love being the center of attention and they love that we are praising them. So using good piggy is, is a wonderful way of managing them. They love touch too. Not touch from everybody, but they yeah. love touch from their family members that they love. I should tell you that they don't like to walk on a leash. And that's one of the reasons that people like to have a pig instead of a dog is because they would rather not go for a walk every day. So if you want to walk your pig every day, I would suggest getting a good dog <laughs> and not a pig because <laughs> they're not athletic. Although I have seen um, people bring pigs to agility, modified agility. And I think, again, that just goes back to the stimulation and you know an enriching environment and that sort of thing so um they wouldn't be able to do all the things that our you know dog companions can but they certainly can in a modified way partake in, in many activities similar to how penny did with with our physical therapy exactly and once they're trained to do things yeah they can they can go um through the through an obstacle course uh as long as it's physically capable and we don't want them to jump. Reason we don't want them to jump is because their front end is extremely heavy compared to the rest of their body. And that front end, every time it comes down on those poor little joints, they're causing those joints to work harder than they need to. So you don't want them to be taught how to jump or jump through something. Uh, staying all four feet on the ground is important. Yeah, I can imagine with their body structure that that, that type of activity would be really taxing on their frame. Yes, yes. You is. know, years ago, I volunteered at Best Friends uh, Animal Sanctuary in Kanab, Utah, and I've been there twice for a week at a time, and I always ask to be able to work with the pigs, to volunteer with the pigs, and I learned so much through that experience. I saw the clicker training that you were referring to, Susan, and I remember asking, you know, the woman that was head of, of this part of the sanctuary, you know, gosh, how long have you been 
working with this pig? And she said, oh, he just came into our care yesterday. She was already having him do all of these things. He was super engaged. And, you know, that's awesome. When you're used to clicker training, can you avoid using food? Or is that a case where you would need to pair it with food, like in the traditional sense? What I, uh, what I tell people when they're training a pig with a clicker is that have them do at the very beginning it's reinforcement with food reinforcement with food and then once you realize that the pig has caught on to the first step you can go for uh, three times before you need to give them another treat so you can do a treat every third command i think that's common kind of that reduction of food reward even with other animals such that then they will respond to praise or having sequenced the behavior uh, properly and having its own intrinsic reward by doing it correctly and pleasing their your owner yeah susan can pigs be uh, litter box trained or do they need to go outside frequently like a, a dog would they are excellent at litter box training. When they're babies, if you limit the space that they have and you provide them with a tray with an absorbable towel or pee pad, something of that nature, you'll find as long as it's far away from as far away as possible from their nest, their little bed area, they will almost instantly use that area from the moment it is born it is naturally instinctively going to walk away from the mother's nursing area to go to the bathroom and goes to the bathroom and comes back to the nursing nest so as so, not to leave a scent near mom and the near other... the bed yes uh -huh. yes exactly so you don't want to you don't want to soil your nest i mean if you're if you've got a little piglet and it's confined to a relatively small room or space, you'll find that it can be completely litter box trained almost immediately. But if you take that little piglet and let it go throughout your house, what it is thinking is that, oh, under the grand piano in the living room is not my nest. I'll go to the bathroom here. It's even better than going to the bathroom in my litter box, which is very close to my bed. So it makes sense to the pig to go as far away as possible to go to the bathroom. Can you tell us how else the pig perceives the world through different senses? Yes. Uh, and so in comparing to dogs, because that's what we know the most, or cats, is that the pig sees very poorly. A dog sees very clearly. So a pig vision is totally blurred. And the only thing that comes into focus on a pig's eye is something that's moving very fast. So a pig won't like fast moving things, and that's because if, if an animal is chasing it, it will come to uh, in, in its vision and be able to start running away from it. Their sense of hearing is not near as good as a dog. It's more on the level of a human. And their uh, sense of taste, oh my goodness, they've got so many more taste buds, which than we do, and I believe that's probably the reason that they just love eating. And not only do they eat, they don't gulp their food like a dog might gulp uh, a treat or their food, they savor it, they chew it and savor it. So their sense of taste is, is different as well. But the most important thing is their sense of smell. That sense of smell is so keen. Thus the truffles? Yes, thus the truffles, yes. Truffles are way underground, uh, at least a couple feet is my understanding. And the pig uh, can smell them. And it's my understanding also that the pig, or what she thinks she is smelling, is the scent of a boar. And so often they use female pigs that are in heat to search for truffles. To think that we covet truffles and now to know that they smell like a boar. I, mm. <laughs> I 
going to have to rethink <laughs> that one. Right. That brings us to our next point with Susan. Like what, what qualifies a person to be a forever home for a pig? What, what are the qualifications? What do we need? I'm glad you asked that question. The person who's looking at getting a pig should consider three things before they consider anything else. And number one is veterinarians are not easy to come by. And are you willing to travel? to get vet, good vet care for your pig because you may have to travel even into other states. Zoning is also an issue. Not all towns will want you to have a pig as a pet. So you have to be very certain and very clear with your zoning. The third thing that I am diligent about is you must be a homeowner. You can't depend on a landlord to be faithful to his word, even when it's in the lease, that you can have pigs in your home. So these are three things that have nothing to do with the pig that do have to do with you and your location. The other thing is time. Do you have enough time for an animal like this? This is a childlike animal. And you need to make a 18 year commitment because that's what we are hoping for as far as how long do they live. And lifestyle, are you too busy? Are you planning a family in the near future? You know, did you want to travel? So all of these things, your lifestyle also is important that you examine yourself before you even think about getting a pig. What about where the pig's going to live? Now, there are actually two kinds of pet pigs. One lives in the house, like I'm sure Penny did. <laughs> Penny lived in a house, I'm, sh I'm certain. <laughs> and they have their own little cubby and their own little bed and their own little routine. And they are a house pet, just alongside of your dog and cats and birds and everything else that you might have living in your home. But we also have a population of pet pigs that live out in the barnyard. So we do have these two distinctively different types of pets. And so if you're going to bring them into your home, you're going to need to make sure that you give the pig, indoor pig, outside time. That's mandatory and it's daily daily outside time. Uh, you can't keep a pig in the house all the time. You, you need to know whether or not you want, you know, a house pet or would you prefer to have one out in the barnyard? Also, I like to talk to people when they are adopting a pig about their own personality. They're, are they a nurturing person? Do they really want to parent? Are they a parental? Are they patient? The one thing I have learned from pigs is patience. You have to wait for the pig to decide it's going to be his idea. You also have to recognize that transportation, it's so much harder than it is with a dog. You know, you go, shh, come on, Rover, let's go for a drive, you know, and he's in the car before you get your keys out. With a pig, you know, it's almost like taking a newborn. You got to make sure you have this and make sure you have that. And then you're going to have to get the ramp out and you're going to have to make sure that it's secured in the crate or so. Yeah, it's not easy. And do you have a minivan or do you have a sports car? It's going to make a difference in how you get your pig because you are going to have to transport that pig at some point in time. So you need to realize that. Another thing is the Department of Agriculture also has regulations about the movement of pigs from one state to the other. And I think uh, people should be aware of that regulation. I did not know that. I did not know that you, there were regulations from state to state. Uh, do you think that they, they travel well? I think that they need to be secured in a crate. The best way to travel with them is to put them in a crate and now they're feeling safer. They are afraid of fast movements and loud noises. So you're on the turnpike. Your pig may get frightened over some truck that just passed you or a train going by, and you end up with that pig in your lap. And 
that's very dangerous and it's causing a lot of anxiety and stress for your pig to be just loose in your car. So I do recommend um, using a crate to, for transport. So Susan, speaking of the crate, then do pigs need to be crate trained? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they don't just automatically take to a crate. Crate training is uh, is really important uh, for the pigs that I'm adopting out. Crate training is one of the things that I uh, I make almost mandatory for them. My pig, my piglets, my pigs are all crate trained. They like the crate. It's their safe space. And uh, if they don't use a crate in the house, which is also okay, but it does need to be a cubby. They, they'll migrate to the bottom of your closet or in the hallway linen closet, something like that. They do not want to be out in open. So the crate is really important to them to feel secure. You also mentioned earlier, you know, considering travel and you know vacations and things like that if if you're considering having a pet pig and i had a, a bit of a personal experience with this years ago when i worked at the student health center at the university of colorado i learned that one of our doctors in the facility had a pet pig named hamlet and this was oh gosh 25 30 years ago and so this was the first person that i knew that actually had a pet pig and sure enough it was coming to travel time they were going on vacation and they kind of solicited people around the health center to see if anybody was willing to pig sit if you will for hamlet of course i you know was first to raise my hand i'll do it i'll do it but then when i talked to them and learned more about hamlet's care needs i'm, I'm like I, I don't think i can do it you know, based on where I lived and stairs. And also I had just paid a lot of money to have my yard landscape, beautiful sod and, and hardscape rocks and things. And I'm like, you know, does Hamlet dig? Does he root? And they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> and I was like, didn't do it. And I felt horrible, you know, for backing down. But again, it kind of goes back to just that education piece and knowing, you know, the questions to ask and, and, you know, if it is indeed a, a good fit. And that was just for a short period of time, you know, a couple of weeks. Well, vacation time for a lot of pig owners is a big, big problem. And there are very few uh, facilities that will take in a, a pig. And even if you find a dog boarding facility that's willing to do it, you also have a fear factor because pigs are afraid of dogs, not so much their family dog. They can get a, very accustomed to that dog and actually enjoy the dog. But when you're put in a situation where you're hearing strange dogs, those are all predators barking and they, and they don't know why. So high anxiety. So Finding a place to put your pig is a big problem. And that's one of the things that you also need to talk about or think about when you are getting a pig. Fortunately, Ross Mill Farm is a popular pig boarding facility. So my people have a way and we're also do vet care. So the people I'm adopting to, I am providing services that they may not find on their own if they live in a different area. It's wonderful that you're providing veterinary care because I think that's one of the top things that are of concern when you're getting an animal like a pot belly pig is who's the veterinarian around you that specializes in pot belly pigs. And it's really important to find a veterinarian that works with this particular type of animal. Your regular cat and dog veterinarian isn't necessarily familiar with a pot belly pig and what their medical needs are, what their disease processes are how sensitive they are to medications, anesthesia, or even blood drawing. You know, for if you're going to bl draw blood from a dog, you can get it from a leg vein, but you can't get blood from a leg vein on a pig. You have to go for something else like an ear vein. Like you need to know those things. And that's especially with medication or particularly with anesthesia. You have to know, go to somebody who knows about pigs. And Kathy, well, you know, we always talk about how much we love the Medcovet Luma to decrease inflammation. Right. And I've talked to that company specifically about, can we use this with a pig? And they said that would not be indicated because again, their skin is so thick and you know, the layer of fat, I suppose subcutaneously and things like that, that 
it would not be likely to penetrate and get right. to the tissues at hand. Now right. with Penny, we used a clinical laser and it was a more superficial area because it was her forelimb. But yeah, so that's one thing I love about MedcoVet as well is that they're very honest. They don't want to, you know, say that it's going to be the magic bullet for every species or every ailment. So they are very trustworthy in that respect. So can we piggyback on veterinary care and tell? Did you just say piggyback? <laughs> <laughs> she just said piggyback. I heard it. <laughs> All right. Can okay, go ahead. we indeed piggyback on this idea of veterinary care? And in, in trying to find a veterinarian, we see with uh, vets that they have a lot of good intentions, uh, not just vets, but also like uh, other people that will give services like hoof trimmers. Pigs can be injured by a farrier because of the way that they are handling them, you can do great harm. And also the other thing that veterinarians have a tendency to do is to inappropriately anesthetize. You, you really need to, the vet really needs to understand what the outcome is. To inject a needle in a pig, they, even a small pig or a pig with not that's not overly fat that needle can go way past an inch before it hits any kind of muscle yeah, yeah any yeah it's just where to give them a shot we've seen veterinarians who have given them in the hip um, and caused a sciatic issue you never give a pig a shot in the hip uh, unless you know exactly where you're, you should be hitting. So yeah, so injections, blood draws. Yeah, restraint, I think, is where the, a lot of these injuries happening. Right. And because they're not cooperative. I mean, the vets are trying to, you know, do something and they're not cooperative. So again, patience is needed and know-how. It makes me think of the fear-free movement too, Kathy. You know, again, they, these pigs are so smart. I'm sure it would be relatively easy to get their buy-in to veterinary care and other necessary procedures if it was done properly. You know, the the stereotype of the stubborn pig, um, you know, just like so many things, it's like if if we speak their language and like you said, Susan, make it make the pig think it's their idea, then we can use that intelligence to our favor versus you know, something forceful. It makes me think of when you're talking about the crate too. It's like, if, if a pig doesn't want to go in a crate, <laughs> you're not going to force them in a crate. So, you know, those same principles apply all around. Conditioning and getting their consent. They're intelligent. I think we could probably do that. Slowing down and being patient is very important when you're trying to get a pig to do something. I had a pig, a boarder, who uh, had been coming to board with me for years. And she fell off of her ramp on the way. And so in getting her back into the car when they came back, it was, it was very difficult. And so, you know, I told my staff, okay, we have to think a little smarter than this, this pig. So let's prepare very carefully a chute so that there, she's only going to go one place. And my staff was... Uh, a little nervous because she wasn't going the right way and they were one was stopping her over here and another stopping her there and so she just was not going to go up that crate so I says okay everybody quiet stop let me talk to the pig get in place I went over to the pig and I said to her I called her name and I said we're not going to hurt you we are going to ask you to go up the ramp so that you can go home with your mommy and daddy. And you, you'll be very, very easy. It'll be easy. You're not going to fall off. She turned. She went up the ramp and got in the car. What, I, what I'm telling is that we have to be calm or the, pigs are, the pig will pick up on your energy. When you have any fear of the pig, it knows that. It'll take advantage of you. If you are deliberate and calm and let them think through this complex situation, 
having to go up that ramp, they will think it through, listen to what you said. It was my calming voice, and maybe it was a little animal communication, which I truly believe in, but it took her trust to do that. Susan, you are a pig whisperer. Some people call me a pig whisperer because I do take the time it takes for them to relax. And it is when somebody owns a pig, they also need to know some very basic medical information. And the, the key one is how to take a temperature. That is such a big clue to a veterinarian as to how they're going to treat. Now, if they wait for that temperature to be taken while the pig is in the clinic, it's it's going to get a different reading. And so I always train my people how to take a temperature on a pig. Is that a rectal temperature? Yes, it's rectal. And what yeah. is it? What's a normal pig temperature? I'm curious. About the same as humans, you know, you're not um, about 98 and um, you can go up to 100, 101 and still be kind of not sick, but just overheated for whatever reason. They should have medical care at least once a year. Medical care is is vaccinations. Vaccinations we give are for erysipelas, bordetella and pastorella. That's one uh, vaccine. And then uh, we also know that they can get rabies. And especially those backyard pigs or those barnyard pigs, we definitely want to make sure that they um, have their annual rabies shot. But even the household pigs, if they're, you know, if they have any tendency of biting whatsoever, I would do it. So I actually am recommending it for all pigs is rabies. And then we have deworming. They are susceptible to worms and mange. They are, uh, their mange is uh, species specific. So you can get it, but you're only going to get it as long as that adult mange lives on you. So you need to make sure your pig is free from both worms and parasites. That is the majority of what you need on an annual visit with also hoof trimming. Many of the vets that are taking care of pigs will also do uh, hoof trimming. And uh, the males have tusks, and those tusks will also need to be uh, shaved down. It's not a tooth that has, you know, any nerve ending, so it can be just taken down to the gum line to prevent any damage of furniture or, or bites or punctures. That was one of the areas of trepidation and potentially boarding Hamlet because he was male and he had tusks. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, you know, it, it just looks intimidating. I'm like, I'm sure if he gets upset, that could cause problems. One other medical thing I wanted to bring up, you mentioned earlier that trying to minimize, I guess, impact via jumping. I, I imagine, can, can pigs go up and down stairs? No, I don't recommend it. Can they? Yes, they can go up. And almost all pigs could go upstairs unless they're obese. Um, but coming down again, their their front is so heavy that they can tumble down. Ah. Um, so it's not a good idea to try to keep a pig uh, with a lot of stairs in your home. Well, I was also thinking about the potential for arthritis because I know when I was at Best uh -huh. Friends, many of those pigs uh, that were surrendered to them were obese and they were working very hard to get their weight down. But along with that came a significant amount of arthritis in those little joints, especially of their, their front feet and wrists and elbows and so forth. And that's certainly something that Kathy and I you know, our need, we need to address in, in our dog friends, and we're trying to get the word out there in terms of cats getting arthritis. I'm sure any animal has that potential, and it's something that shouldn't be overlooked. So when the pig goes to the veterinarian, you know, perhaps asking them to determine if there's any arthritic changes, too, that could be addressed. Yes, we are looking for that. And, you know, we put these Poor pigs on um, like a glucosamine supplement very early, sometimes four or five years old, we're already starting to see arthritis. Why don't you tell us 
where does one acquire a pig? Where do you get a pet pig from? Wow, I'm glad you asked that too. Uh, you got some good questions. Um, breeders are one way to get a pet pig. I'm going to caution people here that are thinking about it, that breeders are not always telling the truth. There's a lot of breeders who claim that their pigs are very small. There are no teacup pigs. And any breeder who is claiming that they have teacup pigs should be a big red warning sign. So breeder, be very, very careful if you're selecting a breeder. Livestock auctions are another way that people who are in the uh, farmed animal world might end up at a livestock auction and picking, they're all over the place. They're being given away at livestock auctions. Once in a while, you find a pet store that will be carrying a pet pig, but that's not a good place to buy it either. They're as bad as the breeders who are claiming that it's going to be small. They don't give the right information. And yeah, like flea markets, you might find them at a flea market, but those are, are not good places to go. Now there's also like marketplace or Craigslist or things that you might go to to buy other things. You might find a pig that's up for adoption and be aware that breeders are using Craigslist. And, but there's also sometimes somebody that is just trying to find a good home for somebody like, like Penny or, or like Hamlet. Social media, there are a lot of pig groups that you can go on and it doesn't take very long before you find one that's up for adoption on those pig groups. But what I want everybody to do is get a pig from a reputable uh, rescue organization. Pig Placement Network is a national database of pet pigs and you can go on there no matter where you are in the United States. You can zoom down to your location and for the most part, find a few pigs that are looking for a home. You said something really important that I just wanted to repeat, that there is no such thing as a micro or mini pig. These are Vietnamese pot pigs, and they can reach somewhere between, I'm going to say 80 to maybe 100, maybe 150 pounds. Is that correct, Susan? That's right. It, that is the uh, weight. It's 80 to 150, 160 pounds. Now, the Papale pig that we're seeing today is a mutt. They have no pedigrees. They're mutts. They are combinations of many, many different breeds. So of course, we're not going to know whether a piglet, when we rescue it, is going to be more on the 80 pound side or more on the 150 pound side. So that also is very dependent on how you feed in the first year or two. Your pig should be really well fed, uh, but not overfed as a piglet so that it grows properly to its natural size and not grow to a gigantic fat pig. So yeah, there's no teacups. So Susan, you know, it's interesting, this variation, you know, between 80 and 160 pounds, I mean, that's double in size. So I think, again, we need to emphasize that you have no way of knowing when they're a piglet, and maybe that's one of the advantages of actually adopting an adult pig, because you know exactly what you're going to get. Oh, right on, Chris. <laughs> right. A absolutely. Yeah. Adults, we know, actually, we know by the time that they're six months old, if we, if we can estimate, I can, now not everybody, but I can kind of estimate what that pig is going to be when it is mature. If somebody chooses the rescue route, which I hope they do after listening to this show, especially, how adaptable would you say pigs are? Do they readily accept their new home? I know, you know, it's kind of a misconception with, you know, other animals, dogs, cats, and so forth. You know, people think, oh, you know, they're never, they're never going to do as well in somebody else's home as they would in mine, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, I think that animals in general have a lot of resiliency and they are fairly adaptable. Is that true for pigs as well? 
Yes, they they are adaptable, but again, they're very cautious and they are prey animal and they're coming into the nest of what they consider initially a predator. And so that trust building is really important. And it can, some pigs, it'll only be a day or two when they're starting to feel a level of comfort. And other pigs, it's going to take three or four weeks. Um, some, some pigs are very timid and not very likable to humans because they are standoffish and they don't want to be touched and they don't want to be petted. But that changes drastically uh, when they start to build that trust. And so we do have to realize that the pig needs to have anywhere from a week to a month of adjustments. And even if it's an adult pig going from one home to the next home, there's still this adjustment time. At the very beginning is when I allow pigs, uh, people to use treats for their pig because uh, it's the way to their heart, it's through their stomach. But we want to be very careful not to use those treats to the point where the human now is getting manipulated. So that's at the very beginning is to, you know, show that you've got food and to, to give it to them. But they do need to be in a quiet space to accept touch sometimes. So being patient is real important for, for touching them. Let them come to you. Another mistake that people do is to let them out of their crate when they first come home, maybe into the backyard, and then the pig is running around and now you're chasing it, trying to get it to go back in the, you know, the kitchen door. And that whole scenario causes a huge amount of stress for the pig. So another thing I'm advising is that when you bring a pig home, the, I don't care how old the pig is or young, bring it to the location where you want it to live and then allow it to get out of the crate and uh, go from there to, to build the trust. Piglets are, you know, when, when we see a puppy or a kitten, the first thing we want to do is to pick it up and hold it. Piglets should never be picked up by us, in my opinion, because that is the only time that a piglet leaves the ground is when the big bad wolf is about to take them away and to kill them. They have this instinctive natural fear when their feet leave the ground to scream as loud as they can so that the big bad wolf may drop them and run away. It is the only protection that they have at that point. So here we have this little piglet and it's screaming and you're looking on the internet and it says, hold the pig until it stops screaming. And mm. that really oh, no. it does it there and so that was early on that's kind of how we thought we should be doing it so they got used to it but i certainly know today that's the wrong thing to do yeah. so yeah just let it come to your lap and teach the pig if you want to walk around with it you only got about six months before it's too late anyway but if you really need that is you train the pig to get on your lap and then you can cuddle the pigs in your arms hold it up to your chest and then you can get up and the pig will feel more secure you know susan earlier you said that uh pigs are similar to rabbits because they're both prey animals and we interviewed the educator for the house rabbit society i think her name was doreen reynolds and she said the very same thing in terms of building trust that you know you sit down you let the rabbit approach you and you know when they do that is such a huge win you know if they were to come up and solicit some attention you know to climb in your lap but you never you know reach for a rabbit and it sounds kind of the same thing in terms of the pigs that's that's very true chris so, you know, I know that you really wanted to talk about the, the pig placement network and can you kind of summarize again why people may give up their pig and why this 
national network uh, has come to be, why it's needed. The reasons that people are giving up their pig, it, I think the number one reason is education. They got an animal that they did little or no research prior to getting. And if they did do some research, they often go to the internet or to these pig groups and they're getting the wrong information. They're also not aware that there is no teacup pigs and that's a biggie. But they can get a lot of misinformation from, from social media and, and the media itself. So that's the major reason I think they're given up. But the other is, we touched on this already, housing. We, we need to be sure that the zoning, we get a lot of pigs up for adoption because the zoning laws, uh, the animal control was called in and zoning laws are not going to allow it. Uh, they grow up in somebody's home with a lot of stairs or you need to ramp those stairs. If you've got six stairs going outside to the backyard, you've got to build a ramp for them. Another reason that people give up their pig is the behavior of the pig in that household. And this is where it is really important to understand that pigs that are in a home and they're the only pig in the home are the most problematic area. When you have two pigs in the home, you hardly ever see behavior issues. So uh, people who are thinking about getting a pig should not think about getting one, but getting two. That is key. And I'm not the only one that enforces that, obviously. Best Friends is also. And all a lot of sanctuaries know this very well. So single pig families are causing uh, a lot of behavior issues. Susan, we, do they yes. need to socialize with their own kind or do dogs and other, you know, we see those unlikely friends books and things. Can, mm -hmm. can other species substitute for a pig or they really need to be with another pig? They substitute other animals in the household, cats, dogs, birds, rabbits, just about anything, even a lot of wildlife in the backyard, you know, they can become friends. But a dog and a pig uh, can uh, is a predator and a prey, and a lot of pig injuries are caused from the family dog. Even after years of being together, you know, something happens, and it's always when you're not at home. Pigs and dogs can live together but they don't speak the same language. And when they're not speaking the same language, you can have problems. And so it's really important that a pig have one of its own kind to have, you know, have conversations with. Uh, they snuggle together. They are, they are right next to each other when they go to sleep. And you'll find that one is dominant over the other one with bed, with their nest building, but the other one is dominant over feeding. And so they, mm -hmm. they exchange roles and they both have roles, but they have a companionship. So frequently when I have a pair of pigs that one of them has passed, we see those owners calling us and asking us for another pig that it fills a void it, there's nothing like one of your own species well and they're probably grieving in that case too you know we're talking about their higher intelligence and and uh, emotions as i've taken in a variety of pigs who are poorly behaved and now they're being given up because they are just terrible in the home I have taken those pigs and put them in a different environment, giving them enhanced environment that helps them with their nature. And voila, I've got a great pig. And it has nothing to do with the pig. It had to do with the environment. So that is the other reason that pigs that are being given up.
But the last thing is, and the one that I am most likely to come to your rescue, is when it's hard luck, and there's a lot of it. 16, 18 years is a long time to have an animal, and during that course of time, life changes. And when life changes for people, and they have to give up their pig, it's not an easy thing to do. So you've got home foreclosures, or illness, or even death, divorce. So when these life changes are happening, this is where my heart goes to the people who own pigs and I really want to help them. And it's almost how Pig Placement Network was formed because I wanted to help them no matter where they were in the country. So Pig Placement Network was the answer. I could only take in so many of them and only from a certain location. So Pig Placement Network was started to service the people more in this hard luck cases than anything, but also any for any reason whatsoever, uh, we Pig Placement Network will post your pig, and that's almost like using a using any form of media to announce that your pig is up for adoption. So we we get people who have pigs that need to rehome them again for whatever purpose for whatever reason we will accept your pig and post it on our website with their photograph it's like a pet finder mm -hmm. so somebody who is looking for a pet pig can go to the website and look at the map and find those pigs that are closest to them and check out their profiles, see if there's anything there of interest. But even if it's not on the website, we want you to complete a adoption application, no matter where you are, so that we can help educate you. The application itself is made to help educate. You know, we ask the question, are you aware that there are no teacup pigs? Are, are you aware that you need a backyard? You know, th those kinds of questions are asked to help educate the people. And we not only educate through that, we then do a phone interview. And the phone interview is even more education. And then when we put you together with a pig, who is looking for a home, we're there to help you with being able to answer your questions. How do I introduce them? He's not getting along with my dog. He's, you know, he's charging at the children. What do I do? Um, so I do consultations. Uh, and the reason the consultations were started was because I, every person's problem is an individual. The pig is an individual. The family is an individual. Their environment is different from one another. So consultations are really important and we do consultations for you. I do them. Susan, I think that the, the education is, is the key factor in not having to have these pets rehomed again. Absolutely. Exactly. That is. So we're finding your forever home and you're not going to get rehomed again because we've educated you on everything you need to know. And now you are a part of the pig community or the pig network community because now you have support. Right on. That mm -hmm. is so true. So that's pig placement network is playing a major role in helping people find it. Um, there's a statistic that I found to be very interesting. 19% of the people who are filling out these applications, that's almost 20% or one out of five, are going to keep their pig because they found out that they can be litter box trained or, you know, a variety of reasons. But we help educate and I love it when we have those numbers come up that says the family decided to keep the pig. So Susan, can you state the website for our audience where they can go to get the resources and information from the Pig Placement Network? It's exactly that, pigplacementnetwork.org. .org. 
Okay. O-R-G. Yeah. And I'm just going to run down again, just to summarize some of the things that are found there and the ways that you educate. So you have Zoom webinars, YouTube videos, the consultations that you mentioned, podcasts such as Petability. And we hope to see that on the, the website. That's very cool. You have a whole library. You have an internship program with vet students, specifically at uh, Rowan University School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, newsletter, uh, you carry on events and farm tours, I'm assuming at the Ross Mill Farm. And Kathy had already mentioned in the introduction, you know, all the media coverage that you're trying to get to build awareness out there. So again, your passion for pigs, uh, your life's work of 33 years and what you've done for these very intelligent cool creatures is just so heartwarming and uh, the world's a better place uh, because of you, Susan. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. I, I really admire the work that you're doing and keep doing it. I thank you. The pigs thank you. And, and they need an advocate. They, they definitely need an advocate. So thank you for that. Yes, and we're going to have the website in the show notes. Please reach out if you have any questions. And if you are considering potentially bringing a pet into your wonderful home, please consider adoption first. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thanks, Susan. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.